Okay, this is for Astronomy 320. This is a review for the quiz. The on this is for quiz two. Okay, I haven't put that up yet, but here's online lecture two. This is where you can turn it in, and then this is where you can download it. No, nope, this is where you can download it. Also, PowerPoint for chapter two is up. It's if you've already downloaded it, you may have only downloaded the partial part. Okay, it's 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 been updated the last couple of days. This one covers the entire chapter. Okay, so you want to download this again to make sure you have the full version of Chapter 2 PowerPoint. And then here's where you can download the online lecture that we're going to be looking at right now, and it is right here. Okay, so just to go through some of these quickly, what defines an Earth day is the time it takes for Earth to complete one rotation on its axis, to go through 360 degrees on its axis. Basically, the time it takes for the sun to be overhead, directly overhead, to the next time the sun is directly overhead. What defines an Earth year? That's the time it takes the, sun, the Earth to complete 100, one orbit around the sun, to go completely around the sun 360 degrees. That is one Earth year. Okay, why can we see Polaris from Sacramento all year around? Because Polaris exists up above the axis of the North Pole, it would go through the North Pole. It's above the North Pole, so it's always up in the sky, okay? So here we are, this is approximately where Sacramento is. We can see these guys year-round. As long as it's night, we can always see these, because we go around like this. And they're always up here. Now these are the stars we can only see part of the year, okay? If we're going around the sun, we got to have the sun over here. Then at night, we can see these guys. But then we go around the sun, and now the sun's over here. We can't see these guys because they're up during the day, but we can see these stars over here, okay? So, that's why we can see Polaris year-round. Why can we only see the constellation Orion part of the year? Um, well, again, uh, if you watch the PowerPoint, I go through that in Stellarium. But basically, that would put Orion's going to be one of the one of them that are over here. It's, it's here closer to the celestial equator. So therefore we can only see it basically most be, best in the winter. In the winter it's up but in the summer it's up at the same time the sun is up. So that's why we can't see it in the summer much. We can see it a lot better in the winter because it's over here. Okay, um, what which culture is given credit for a we're first attempting to formulate theories to try to explain the natural universe. That would be the Greeks. The Greeks believed in intuition. They didn't like things like uh, Atlas holding up the Earth. It was Atlas and Apollo pulling the sun across the sky. They wanted to come up with reasonable explanations for why these things were happening. And they went by intuition, maybe a little bit of observation. But what they did not do is experimentation. They just, they just used their intuition to try to come up with these rules. Some of them were pretty good. Some of them were way, 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 way off. The Greeks believed in heavenly perfection. What constraint did this place on the orbits of the planets? It meant that the orbits of the planets had to be perfectly circular. And that really hung things up. That's why Copernicus's model of the solar system was so flawed, because he stuck to this heavenly perfection idea. It was Kepler that came along and said, wait a second, they're actually ellipses, they're not circles. Now everything fit into place and predicting the future position of a planet became a lot more accurate. The Greeks argued that if Earth was in motion, that parallax, closer stars moving relative to more distant stars, would be observed. What was missing in the Greeks' understanding of the universe that led to this flawed argument? Well, it's because the stars are so far away. Nah, where is it? I should hit pause. I missed it. Hold on. It's actually a lot. It's actually a lot further down than I thought it was. So the Greeks argued, look, Earth is moving, right? We see these two stars are lined up. Earth moves down a little bit. Okay, now this star here looks. We got to look back here to see that star, and this star is over here. So it looks like they move relative to each other. Okay. But we don't observe that. I mean, the Greeks didn't observe that. We can't observe that with the naked eye. Why? Because the stars are so, 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 so far away. They're incredibly huge distances away. And this parallax that does exist, it's so small that you need very precise instruments that were way beyond what the Greeks had at the time to be able to measure parallax. 
Okay, so that's their fatal flaw, that why they, and that's why that argument was wrong. Okay, explain the Potomac model of the universe. Again, that was where you had the Earth at the center of the universe, and you had to have the planets make little tiny epicircles, little tiny circles. So here's Ptolemy's model of the universe. You got the Earth at the center, the Moon and the Sun orbit the Earth, but then all the other planets have to, in order to, to make this work, they have to make these little circles all over the place, okay? And it just was not a very satisfying theory, but you had perfect circles being made on top of perfect circles. That was better than arguing that, that there were ellipses or that the Sun was actually the center of the solar system. Okay, so that's that one, and then... Um, what is Nicholas Copernicus's what is Nicholas Copernicus is giving credit for? He's giving credit for mathematically showing that it's best to view the sun at the center of the universe. Basically, the sun's not the center of the universe, it's the center of our solar system. And so he's the one that's first giving credit. Now his his predictions were off. Why? Because he stuck to the uh, perfectly circular orbits, the heavenly perfection that the Greeks uh, we're, we're all for, okay, but he's the one that we give credit to, even though other people try to make the same argument for him, but um, he's the one that's given credit, probably because he published and he did a lot of mathematical work that kind of showed that that may be the way we should be headed. We should be headed toward thinking of the sun as the center of the solar system and not the earth. Tycho Brahe was a brilliant uh, had, had, was brilliant at making equipment in order to ver make very precise measurements of the positions of the planets, okay, and he, he, he accumulated a ton of data about the positions of Mars, of Venus, of Mercury, of Saturn and Jupiter, exactly where they were at this time and at this time and at this time. Okay, now he had all this mounds of data. Nobody had data like this because he had way more precise instruments and so on. Problem was he was not the mathematical genius who could take that data and make some kind of sense out of it all, but Kepler was. Okay, so now we got Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. Okay, here's Copernicus, what he did, Tycho Brahe, what he did up here, and then uh, Johannes Kepler, okay? And so his first law, the orbit of each planet about the sun is an ellipse with the sun at one focus. So he threw out the idea of heavenly perfection of the Greeks that the orbits had to be perfect circles. Okay, then you have that a star moves faster in the part of the orbit near the sun and slower when further from the sun, sweeping out equal areas in equal times. And basically, I think the more uh, traditional way to put it, an imaginary line joining a planet and the sun will sweep out equal areas in equal amounts of time, which means that when the planet is further from the sun, the line's longer, so the, sun must, the, the planet must go slower. And when the planet is closer to the sun, the line is shorter, meaning that you got to have the, the planet move faster. Okay. More distant objects orbit the sun at a slower average speeds, at slower average speeds, obeying the precise mathematical relationship. The period squared is equal to the distance from the sun cubed. P is the planet's orbital period and, is, and A is the planet's average distance from the sun. If we measure them, we have to measure them, the P, the period in Earth years and the uh, distance from the sun in astronomical units. Remember, one astronomical unit is the distance between the Earth and the sun. So that was. Kepler's three laws of planetary motion. That's what his contribution was, his three laws of planetary motion. Okay, that was one, two, three. Some of the important contributions Galileo made to physics and astronomy, well, he, one of the things, he designed a better telescope, and he was the first one to point the telescope at the sky, okay? Among the many things he found that was that the moon was not perfectly smooth, it was not pearl-like. He found that there are moons orbiting Jupiter. He found sunspots on the sun, so he actually looked directly at the sun with a telescope, which is a bad, 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 bad idea. He didn't have filters and stuff like we have now to, to filter out the bad light. He didn't understand what the bad light that could damage his eye would be. And then um, phases of Venus and other things and in contribution to physics, for example. He's, he's called the father of modern science because he actually went out and did experiments. Remember, we were still doing it the way the Greeks did it, through intuition and just thinking about something and not actually going out and trying it. So the Greeks said that if you have two different masses, you drop them from a height, 
the, the larger mass will fall faster than the smaller mass. Okay, well, Galileo went out and tried it, and he saw that that was not true, not by a, any stretch of the imagination. And so, and then also, you talk about the fact that objects inherit Earth's motion, so we're moving along with the Earth, okay? So that's why when we jump up in the air, we, we fall, come right back down to where we jumped up from. Okay, we inherited the, the speed of the Earth, just like you're sitting in a car, you throw a ball in the air, it comes back down, you catch it, it you know, it, the, the ball inherits whatever velocity the car has, and, whatever, and therefore whatever velocity you had while you were holding it. Okay, Newton's first law of motion, an object at rest, well, let's hold on. Okay, so in the PowerPoint, you've got some of the things that Galileo did, uh, mod modern science, ju moons orbiting Jupiter, sunspots, and so on. Okay, they're, they're all right there in PowerPoint. There is a telescope similar to one he built, and then it, these, are, these are some of his discoveries. And then also he dropped, he probably did not really drop two objects from the Leaning Tower Pizza, but he did do experiments with planks and Earth is in motion, and, and we, we, um, we, we inherit the motion of the Earth. Okay, uh, there's a stellar parallax, I don't know why it's way down here. Alright, Sir Isaac Newton. Okay, the first law basically states that um, an object at rest or in motion with a constant velocity will remain in that state unless acted upon by a net force. That means that objects want to keep doing what they're already doing. Now the Greeks would have said, well you push something, it slides a little bit, and it comes to a stop. It came to a stop because you took your push away. No, I, Newton is saying no, that thing wanted to keep going. Okay, what brought it to a stop? Friction. If you take away the friction, that thing will keep going and going and going forever. You push a hockey puck on ice, it keeps going and going and going. And so basically we now follow Newton's laws, not the Greeks, not the Greeks laws, and as a result, things got went fast. Once we understood how these things work, things went very, very fast. Newton's second law basically says that, that force equals mass times acceleration. And Newton's third law says that for every force, there's an equal and oppositely directed force. Okay. And list some of the other important contributions Newton made to physics, mathematics, and astronomy. <clears throat> he one of the most important things was he's the, he's the one that developed calculus. Differential calculus by himself, basically. Integral calculus, he was in a race with a German by the name of Leibniz for, for integral calculus. But basically, that branch of calculus, that just came from Newton. And so he did a lot of work in optics. Also, Newton, Newton's universal law of gravitation, that's something we haven't talked about because our book doesn't have it yet. I think it's coming up but other things, but mainly you just want to concentrate on, on what the, uh, what the, what's in the PowerPoint, and that is it. So just as an example of the kind of question I can ask, final thoughts, final thoughts, Hallmark of Science, uh, where is it? So, yeah, sample multiple choice question, which of the following is Newton giving credit for? Okay, so discovery that or orbits the planets are elliptical, no, that was Kepler. First place in the sun at the center of the source. Nope, that's Copernicus. Stating that objects that want to keep doing what they're already doing and only a net force will change their motion, that's Newton. Okay, discovery moons orbiting Jupiter, that's Galileo. So another way I could say who discovered moons orbiting Jupiter, and you could have like down here uh, Newton, Kepler, Brahe, Galileo, Copernicus, whatever. Okay, so that's the kind of question I would ask about these. I would not ask specific physics questions because you need more than what we did to cover that to understand it. But you got to know what, what these guys did. you got five of them you want to study. It, it goes Copernicus, Brahe, Kepler, Galileo, and Newton. <coughs> okay, I think that's everything. Hopefully I kept this short so it'll upload pretty fast. And I'll, good afternoon, good night, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.